A corpse discovered with overdeveloped athlete's legs, strange wedge-shaped feet, a scrap of paper torn from a poetry book with a single phrase hidden in a secret pocket. Who is the man behind the weirdest unsolved death ever? November 30, 1948, Adelaide, Australia. It was a clear, warm night, the first summer day of the southern summer. John Bain Lyons and his wife decided to take the opportunity of nice weather and beautiful clear night skies to do some stargazing down by the beach. As the couple walked along the sand, they spotted a man up ahead of them, dressed in slacks, a suit jacket, and a button-up shirt with a smart tie, but is lying in the sand with his head leaning against the seawall. The man lifts his right arm up and then lets it fall back to the ground. Assuming they had stumbled across a drunk sleeping off a bender, the couple ignores him and continues their pleasant stroll. Thirty minutes later, a second couple comes across the man. As they walk along the seawall, they see the smartly dressed man done up in a suit to its shoes spit polished to a perfect shine. The man isn't moving, and mosquitoes cover his face. The boyfriend jokes, he must be dead to the world not to notice them. He has no idea how right he is, or that he's just stumbled across the most mysterious death in history. The next morning, a small crowd is gathered around the man. It's become clear to all that he is well and truly dead. The body is cold, and a half-smoked cigarette rests on his collar as if it's fallen out of his mouth while being smoked. The police are immediately contacted and the body removed to Royal Adelaide Hospital for inspection. The coroner suspects the man was poisoned, leading to heart failure. Try as they might, though, the authorities can't identify the man. He carries no ID, no wallet or cash, his clothes have no name tag, and all but one of the clothing designer's labels have been cut off. Inside his pockets are tickets from Adelaide to the beach where he was found dead, and a pack of chewing gum, two matches, two combs, a pack of cigarettes with seven cigarettes of a different, more expensive brand inside of it. The police begin questioning the locals, but nobody knows who the man is. Meanwhile, the coroner continues his own investigation, deducing the man has indeed been poisoned, but not by food. Curiously, the man has unnaturally small pupils, and his spleen was three times normal size. The liver is greatly distended with blood. Despite being in his late 40s, the man has extremely well-defined calf muscles, clearly the legs of a very accomplished athlete. However, his toes are wedge-shaped, leading an expert to suppose the man had been in the habit of wearing high-heeled and pointed shoes. Was the man a cross-dressing fitness enthusiast or perhaps a ballet dancer? Nobody knew. Fingerprints were taken and shared throughout the entire English-speaking world, and yet no identity for the mysterious corpse could be ascertained. His photos were published in newspapers and dozens of locals brought to the morgue to identify the body, yet nobody recognized the mysterious dead stranger. As the investigation intensifies, a poison expert believes he knows how the man was killed, but the poisons that may have been used are so deadly he refuses to name them out loud in court. Sir Cedric Stanton Hicks instead writes the name of two poisons on a scrap of sheet paper, Digitalis and Strophanthin. Both of these poisons are incredibly toxic and have the added benefit of breaking down very quickly after death, leaving no trace behind for police to discover. One of the poisons is so rare it can only be made from a combination of the oil inside the seeds of specific plants in Africa, parts of a poisonous fish native to the Benue River, and snake venom. The poison is used by one Somali tribe for hunting and has a terrifying reputation of its ability to kill an adult human in 10 minutes or less. Police are now broadening their investigation across Adelaide and checking in with every hotel, dry cleaner, lost property office, and railway station for lost or abandoned luggage, perhaps the victim left behind some personal belongings that could shed light on the mystery. On January 12th, detectives at the main railway station are given a brown suitcase that has been deposited there on November 30th. The suitcase has no identifying characteristics. In fact, it's clear that somebody went through a lot of trouble to remove all the labels and brand markings. Only a single label on a shirt remains, with the name T. Keen written inside, but the police quickly conclude the name is a red herring, meant to throw people off the trail of the owner's real identity. However, police do find orange thread inside the suitcase that's identical to the thread used to repair a hole in the dead man's trouser pocket. The suitcase and its strange contents belong to the victim. Other than the three shirts, the suitcase also contains a stencil kit used to stencil labels on cargo aboard merchant ships, a table knife missing part of its haft, and a coat stitched in a style native to America but not Australia. Just when police thought the mystery couldn't possibly deepen, a shocking new find on the corpse would open up a bevy of new questions. The authorities brought in an expert pathologist to re-examine the corpse and its possessions in the hopes of gathering more clues. While the new investigation into the body revealed nothing new, a more thorough search of the man's clothing revealed a small pocket sewn into the waistband of the man's trousers 
and inside it, a tightly rolled up scrap of paper with the words Tamam Shud written on it. A reporter for the Adelaide Advertiser recognized the words as Persian and recommended the police look into the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, a book of Persian poetry from the 12th century that had been translated by Edward Fitzgerald and become quite popular in Australia during the war years. The words are discovered to be the last words in the English translation of the book, and it meant it is ended. Despite a search of libraries, booksellers, and publishers, though, the police can't find a copy of the book with the same font as that on the scrap of paper. By now, the body has begun to decompose, but police were reluctant to give up their only real leads, so they had the body embalmed and buried in a plot specifically chosen to be easier to exhume should the need arise. A full eight months after the mysterious death, a man walked into the police station in Adelaide with a rather mysterious tale. Shortly after the discovery of the unidentified body, he and his brother-in-law went for a ride in a car that he kept parked just a few hundred yards from the beach the dead man was found on. The duo spotted a copy of the Rubaiyat lying on the floor of the rear seats, but each assumed it belonged to the other. Upon reading the newspaper account of the mysterious death, the man had a hunch and checked the book, discovering, to their surprise, that the final words of the book had been torn out. It was a perfect match to the scrap of paper found in the dead man's secret pocket. But that wasn't the only secret the book held. Written on the back cover so lightly in pencil as to almost be missed was a phone number, along with a few letters written in capitals. The phone number is unlisted, but it belongs to a young woman that police refuse to identify in order to protect her identity. That woman confirms that she once gifted the book in question to a man during the war, Alfred Boxall. At last, the police have a name, and it only took days to find his home in Maroubra, New South Wales. Mystery solved, except for one problem. Boxall was still alive and still had the copy of the book that the nurse gifted him. The police are at a dead end yet again and return to the nurse. The nurse tells the police that sometime the year before, some neighbors had told her that a man had come by and asked for her. When police showed her a cast they had made of the dead man's face, the nurse looked as if she would faint, but denied she knew who he was. Though police suspected the nurse knew more than she was telling, they were once more at a dead end, until they took a closer look at the book found in the parked car. Under a UV light, police discover a jumble of letters and realize they have a code of some type on their hands. The code is published in the press and sent to naval intelligence and the best code breakers in Australia. The Navy reports back that the code seems to be unbreakable, there's simply not enough of it to make sense. Police never did crack the code, and no further clues would be forthcoming in the case of the world's most mysterious death. Amateur sleuths in modern times would re-examine the case and suspect that the nurse and the dead man clearly knew each other given the intensity of her reaction to being presented a cast of the dead man's face. The identity of the nurse, which the police had kept hidden, was finally revealed and photos of the woman's son suggested a striking similarity to the dead man. A second dead man will be found with a copy of the Rubaiyat in Australia, a Jewish immigrant from Singapore named George Marshall. He was discovered with a copy of the book near him, a seventh edition from a publisher in London. There was only one problem, the book was only ever published in five editions, making the seventh edition publishing as fake as that linked to the original dead body in 1948. Finally, a careful review of police files discovered that in 1959, a man gave a statement that on that night in question, he had seen one man carrying another man on his shoulder near the water's edge and very close to where the dead body was later discovered. Recently, DNA was successfully extracted from the hairs found in the casting of the man's face made by police. An investigation into possible relatives discovered that the man might have had a large group of relatives living on the east coast of the United States, potentially making our mystery man an American and not Australian. However, no living relative has yet been confirmed. What does any of this mean? Who is our mysterious dead stranger with unusually small pupils, enlarged internal organs, well-defined athlete's legs, and a copy of a book that may have been part of a secret code? Some have theorized that the man must have been a spy, given the location of a top-secret British rocketry base a few hundred miles away. Other theories posit that the man might have been part of a very influential criminal underground network and crossed the wrong people. Whatever the truth may be, it seemed that it died on that summer night back in 1948. Only adding to the mystery, flowers would be left on the dead man's grave until 1978, with nobody ever discovering how they were left there or who was responsible. Now, go check out A Man From A Country That Doesn't Exist for more mystery, or click this other link instead.